Become a member on Patreon to receive all exclusive content and to get access to the video version of the podcast interviews. The link is in the description. What I love about your books is you, it's like a story. You have many books. It mm-hmm. seems like it's a thousand books, it seems like. Uh, and you cover it all. It's almost like a jigsaw puzzle. Each one connects the dot. Mm-hmm. You do that so perfectly well, and I think you do that better than any other researcher hands down. Oh, thank you. So, but when I got here, I was in a room because I, uh, at the hotel room, and I was changing and everything. And uh, on the TV, my wife was watching the the, the prince getting married or whatever. Mm-hmm. They had a documentary, a doc, docu-movie, whatever they call them, on. They had Prince Charles in there. This is right when I was heading out the door. <laughs> right when I was heading out the door, Prince Charles in the movie said they, he brought their kids to Africa right after Princess Diana died. Mm-hmm. As soon as I walked out the door, it caught my eye. He said, this is Africa, the birthplace of humanity. Mm-hmm. I'm paraphrasing a little bit. That's, I think that's exactly what he, he stated. Now, what do you think, Joseph? Well, the, the standard genetic thinking right now is that humanity does come from Africa and that it migrated from basically central eastern Africa up through Europe, out into Asia, and so on and so forth. And the typical dating that they give for some of these genetic capital groups that they've been tracing they, they use very sophisticated computer algorithm programs to divide up humanity in terms of haplogroups that are based on mitochondrial DNA, the female DNA. And they've basically traced this back now to approximately 150,000 years ago when they think modern mitochondrial human DNA arose, and it arose in Africa. The interesting problem <laughs> there is that uh, they have discovered what they call mitochondrial Eve. In other words, they've they've been able to more or less uh, make a a very good case that all of humanity ultimately comes from some common mother in that the mitochondrial DNA in all humans appears to be the same. Mm -hmm. The problem is that they've discovered the same thing about what they call Y-chromosomal atom. And Y-chromosomal atom is about 100,000 years older (laughs) than mitochondrial Eve. So, you know, (laughs) this presents a little problem. They're not talking much about it, but (laughs) but, uh, what interested me about it was when I did, did the book Genes, Giants, Monsters, and Men, um, I compared what they were talking about in terms of the haplogroups of, of human females to the ancient texts where in the Sumerian tradition, in the, in the Mesopotamian tradition, you basically get the idea that there were 14, I think it was 14 female donors to this big grand genetic engineering project that you discover in those texts and one male donor from, quote-unquote, the gods that jumpstart modern humanity into existence. And if that's the case, the geneticists kind of in a roundabout way have kind of corroborated that, that ancient story because, of course, the gods, you know, that come down, they lower kingship from heaven and all of that in those texts, the gods are obviously older than modern man. But the other thing that's very interesting about that story is that genetically, if, if that project is to have any hope of success, we would have to be genetically similar to whoever it is that's coming down. And I find that very interesting because, you know, I talk about many times in different interviews, I talk about our genetic cousins. And if you look at some of the cylinder seals and so on from that area of the world, they portray kings, the Lugal A, which, you know, is is their term for a king. That means quite literally the the large man or the big man. So a king seated seated on his throne in those ancient cylinder scripts is portrayed in a very large fashion. 
And then you have these tiny little humans bringing little offerings or gifts or whatever to this, you know, big king. And of course, the standard academic response is, well, you know, they're just portraying this metaphorically. You know, they're portraying the king as huge stature mm -hmm. to portray his political status. Mm -hmm. But, you know, the way I look at it is that's a little evidence for giants. Uh, so, you know, as far as I'm concerned, we're looking at little confirmations here and there if you take those ancient texts seriously. But, you know, there's a big problem in terms of, of the dating of mankind just genetically. You add to this some of the uh, some of the archaeological evidence that people like Cremo and Thompson have, mm -hmm. have unearthed in Forbidden Archaeology, which is a book I highly recommend people read. <laughs> what do you think about that, uh, Joseph? Do you think that we go that far back? Because I, I believe he says hundreds of thousands of years or possibly even a million. Well, maybe? this is what I was getting to. I We... You know, we tend to think of humanity as Homo sapiens sapiens, in other words, the species that we are now. But we forget that Homo sapiens sapiens is part of the bigger genus Homo sapiens, which is part of an even bigger phylum or family called Homo. So in other words, the way I think that we have to look at it is we may have cousins out there that are very similar in appearance to us, very similar to us in terms of genetic makeup. And that sounds, that sounds crazy, but when you compare it to some of their archaeological data, one of the things that I, I pointed out in uh, the Cosmic War was they discovered a coin that had been discovered in, I believe it was southern Illinois, in stratigraphy that would have dated it to approximately a quarter of a million years ago. Which is right about the time, if you if you take the genetic information I mentioned earlier, you know, mitochondrial Eve and Y chromosomal Adam mm -hmm. being about 250,000 years ago, that coin is from approximately that time period. Well, this coin is very unique in that it was milled. In other words, it went through a mill press, <laughs> you know, like a modern coin. I think I've seen that coin. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's it's very peculiar looking. It's got writing on it. You know, it's obviously worn, being so old. I will put that everything. coin up for the audience to to look at that within this video. Yeah, it's 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 a bizarre thing, you know. And that's just one little example of some of the things that they found. They found kind of uh, oblong oval-like steel tubing in chalk mines in France. It's very, very old. They found those little metal spheres in South Africa and stratigraphy that would have been about a billion years old, and it's clearly machine stuff. So in other words, there is evidence out there that somebody here was here that was intelligent, that was technologically capable, producing these things. All of this has been basically suppressed from the record. So, you know, their, their title is, is very apt, Forbidden Archaeology. We, we, I think, go back a very long way. And let me throw in a little UFO story here, too. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Since we're, well, in, in SS Brotherhood of the Bell, I, I did an analysis of a lot of the Cooper Cantwheel set of the Magic 12 documents. And there's one document in particular, one statement in one of those documents, that I, that struck me as being one of the most profound things in that set of documents. And I'm not concerned, really, with their authenticity or lack thereof. Mm -hmm. I'm concerned with the information in them. Because the information in them, uh, like it or not, has to be coming from somebody on the inside. There's, there's too much good information. There's a lot of disinformation. But this statement, this statement was made in the aftermath of Roswell and the supposed recovery of extraterrestrial bodies. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm not, I'm not in the Roswell ET camp of things. But this statement is so striking because what it said was, after examining this evidence, <clears throat> they had come to the conclusion that the humanoid life form was apparently part of some higher order biology and physics in the universe. In other words, what they're saying is, is that if, if there is an evolutionary path to intelligent life, it's going to produce something like us, which is very, very odd. I mean, 
to be making that statement in 1947 mm -hmm. <laughs> is way ahead of the game. Uh, they're, they're starting to talk in a very similar fashion now and doing so in the mainstream. But in 1947, that's not, <laughs> that's not something that you're going to get a Harvard PhD in biology saying. That's truly sci-fi. That's, yeah, that's, that's <laughs> truly sci-fi back then. So, you know, you, you've got all these little clues out there, and I think they kind of add up to uh, Homo sapiens, not, not Homo sapiens sapiens, but Homo sapiens, the, the humanoid intelligent life form, uh, may be much, much older than, than, we give, than we give credit to. And so we were talking about academia and... Uh, I prefer to call it quackademia. Okay, let's use quackademia. Let's use that. <laughs> so how come quackademia? How come, how come it seems like they're not ready to accept the alternative explanation of our ancient past? Because what are they afraid of, Joseph? Because it seems <laughs> like they they are not ready to re rewrite history. I, well, I that's definitely the think that they are afraid of something. Well, I, I don't think, by and large, most academics I don't think are afraid. I think they're just following what they consider to be good academic practice. In other words, they might acknowledge the existence of such evidence, but they they have difficulty creating a comprehensive model to explain it. Some of them, I think, probably are afraid because the more you get into this and the more you open your mind to it, um, you realize that that the current model of, you know, we were hunting and gathering for tens of thousands of years and all of a sudden we decide to invent mathematics, music, calendars, domestication, agriculture, political organization, and on and on it goes. <laughs> you know, uh, once, you, once you look at that narrative with unjaundiced, un, you know, unskeptical eyes, you realize there's a big problem with it. And they haven't really got any any alternative. And the problem also I think that they're faced with is that in order to entertain alternatives, they have to start entertaining things that make them very uncomfortable. Atlantis, ancient high civilizations, and on and on it goes. This has just recently changed this year because there was an article in Scientific American that was published. And Basically, the paper was, well, if there was an ancient civilization that was technologically sophisticated and industrialized, how would we detect it? And, you know, that's quite a sea change. Um, I think what it represents is kind of a limited hangout. The, the amount of evidence has grown so much that they are having difficulty now simply ignoring it. So they have to start getting their tentacles into it in order to maintain their control of the mm -hmm. narrative. That, that's my best guess. And let's go a little bit further back, Joseph, uh, back to what, when I stated with the origins mm -hmm. that, uh, that Prince Philip stated that that little documentary movie mm -hmm. that I was watching, or as soon as I walked out the door, talking about Africa being the origins of humanity. But how do you believe light was, out of all your research, you know, you've, you have tons of books, you mm -hmm. know, out of all your research and knowledge, uh, how do you believe life was seated here on earth, Joseph? Are you a subs subscriber to Zachariah Sitchin's work? Uh, no. Um, Sitchin, yes and no. Uh, Sitchin's a difficult case. I'll put all the cards on the table. I'm, I'm very sympathetic to the modern physics, theoretical physics view called the anthropic cosmological principle. In other words, physicists are coming to the conclusion, and serious physicists, I'm not talking about fringe people, they're, you know, mm -hmm. uh, Frank Tipler uh, wrote a book for the University Press of, of Oxford University about the anthropic uh, cosmological principle. And basically they're coming to the view that increasingly it's difficult to ignore the physics evidence that suggests that the universe was created for intelligent observers to emerge. So in other words, there, there is an inbuilt, uh, for want of a better expression, there's kind of an inbuilt theosophical or theistic principle. And I don't mean theosophical in the sense of Madame Blavatsky, but kind of a 
philosophical theistic principle involved. Um, now, physicists themselves would dispute that assessment of things. I, you know, I want to be very clear about that, but this ultimately is what they're saying. So, you know, I don't want to. I don't want people to get me wrong when I say that there was some sort of genetic engineering at some point that seems to be indicated by ancient texts. That you know, I disbelieve in God. That's not the case. Yeah. Um, but I do think that when you turn to people like Sitchin, Sitchin's a problem because on the one hand he raises a lot of very good general points namely that if you take these ancient texts at their word and compare them to some of the findings of modern science what you're looking at are ancient descriptions in the best language they had available to them of scientific processes but it's when you look at Sitchin's details that I part company for example he wants to view everything in terms of nuclear weapons and rockets. And I, 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 I'm getting a very different physics when I look at those ancient texts from nuclear weapons and rockets. Um, rockets, first of all, uh, as we're finding out now, rockets aren't going to mine asteroids. They're not going to get us to Mars or back. Uh, so we have to have a different technology. And slowly, you know, we've been watching the trickle and the drip of more and more information that they're coming out with, you know, Lockheed's fusion reactor, the EM drive for NASA, DARPA wants a 100-year warp drive project for the United States. Mm -hmm. You know, all this bizarre stuff that sounds like science fiction. But what that's really telling you is, yeah, we know rockets aren't going to be able to do this. You know, even Von Braun knew that. <laughs> So, you know, uh, so I, I part company with Sitchin on the details of his scenario. The other problem with Sitchin that many academics have raised is that his translations are tendentious in many cases. And so when I examine those ancient texts, I avoid the academic uh, the academic out of claiming, well, it's a translational error. You know, this is, this is, trust me here, I'm a patristics guy, so when academics run out of arguments, they always turn to the translation argument. Um, and there are problems with translation in Sitchin. So when I, when I look at those texts, I use academic translations in order to look at those texts and say, well, you know, don't, don't blame me. This is not Sitchin translating it. This is Stephanie Daly, you know, very credentialed, very qualified, <laughs> you know. Mm -hmm. And uh, you, you get a different view of things when you look at some of those texts in, in those translations. So do you, do you think that we are a product of panspermia? Or do you think that maybe, maybe this is kind of something I think about every now and then, that maybe life possibly somehow, primitive life here on Earth, either dinosaurs or whatever, mm -hmm. Neanderthal, eventually was a product of panspermia or something like some that. seeding operation and then and then there was an intervention in the far ancient past okay those are two different questions um i do think there's evidence of seeding of life here on this planet um and this is kind of a convoluted answer and i'm going to have to go around harvey's barn to explain it <laughs> that's my mother's expression by the way um the the Zulu tribe in in Africa has as a tribal legend that they came to this planet from Mars on Amerikaba, which I find is very interesting because that's a Hebrew word. You know, what are the Zulus doing with a Hebrew word in their mm -hmm. vocabulary? But but uh, Amerikaba in Hebrew means a ship, and you know why why would the why would the Zulus of all peoples on the planet have, have this idea that, you know, well, no, we originated off planet. And I think the Dogon tribe in Africa has a similar sort of uh, legend of some sort of off planet origin. But the long and short of it is, is if you look at these tribal legends and square them to the traditions around the world that we have of the flood, all of those traditions say that this flood was something universal. The problem geologically is, 
is if you look at all the planets in the solar system for evidence of a planetary-wide flood, it ain't on Earth. Guess where it is? Space. Mars. Mars. Because if you look at the geological evidence of Mars, it looks like one whole half of that planet was just smacked with gobs of water, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, at some time in its past, which, you know, explains a lot of things like, you know, the fact that it doesn't have much of a magnet magnetosphere anymore, uh, that it, the atmosphere was just ripped off, that half of the planet looks like it was just scoured, uh, that, and the other half looks like a debris field. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, there's a lot of evidence for, for viewing the flood as something that may have happened on Mars. Put that with your tribal traditions, and what do you get? So I entertain the possibility that some form of humanity may have come here from somewhere else. Again, that squares with, with you know, those tales of Nephilim in the Bible and Anunnaki in the Mesopotamian texts and so on. Um, but in terms of life itself being seeded here, there's been just this last week a paper, serious paper, again, submitted by scientists looking at octopuses, which, you know, octopuses are one of my favorite animals because these things are incredibly intelligent creatures. Mm -hmm. uh, fortunately, they don't live very long or we might be in trouble. Alien in nature. Yeah, and, and yeah, that's what this paper says. You know, these things maybe have come here from, from off planet somewhere. You know, they were seeded here. If that's the case, again, you know, it puts that whole evolutionary explanation for the origin of cephalopods into a cocked hat because supposedly that divergence between the half of, of the evolutionary tree that leads to humanity and the half that leads to the modern octopus I think is about 850 million years ago by their best reckoning. So now we have scientists saying, oh no, this, this whole thing may have been seeded here from, from somewhere else, which would you know explain their very bizarre uh, they're very bizarre makeup, you know, a central brain and then a brain in each arm and it's all connected, and, mm. <laughs> you know. So you've got that, you know, that's just come out. Um, and again, I'm thinking that, that these papers are being released because there's some sort of sea change that they're recognizing, you know, that they can't maintain the current narrative in its, in its current form. Mm -hmm. uh, dinosaurs is interesting because... There is in Christian theology the idea of a gap theory of creation. Uh, this was kind of the, the plaything of, of 19th century evangelicals who noticed that there's a parallel verse to the opening verses of Genesis, verses of Genesis, I think in Jeremiah or Isaiah, where apparently the earth was created and then it was kind of deformed and that there was a, a second remake or a reset that wiped out the dinosaurs and created mammals. Um, I've never subscribed to that theory, but it's out there. Uh, I think eventually you're going to see some attempt by scholars to pull all of this information together and create a new model, a new paradigm. And that's what I think a lot of these scientists are trying to jump in now because they're trying to reassert control over this narrative. I think, I think again, the alternative research community has put so much pressure on some of those standard narratives that it's forcing some reassessment of these things. So where, you know, where in 10 years we're going to end up, I don't know. All right, just a while ago you were talking about Mars. Mm -hmm. And you, you got my little, you got my mind going, in, going around in circles. Like, I'm... It's going in all directions here. And and what I'm thinking, Joseph, is what if, because you talk about the breakaway civilization. I know that was Richard mm -hmm. Dolan's mm -hmm. coined term, the breakaway mm -hmm. civilization, but your research into that is very phenomenal. And what people talk, many other researchers talk about the Mars-Earth connection. Mm -hmm. So what if there was already a breakaway civilization. What if it was the Mars breakaway civilization that came to Earth? Because you were talking about 
the flood, mm -hmm. those were actually on Mars. What if those were written? The, the, the tradition, the verbal whatever was actually from Mars. Mm -hmm. But all of these stories of that maybe in the Old Testament and things like that and that nature, what if a lot of this is maybe possibly from Mars and whenever they, whatever kind of cataclysmic event happened, they broke away and, and seeded life here on Earth. And then my, my theory is they landed all over the world. Mm -hmm. That's why we have pyramids mm -hmm. everywhere, not just in Egypt. And we have these monolithic monuments everywhere. And maybe one of the, I would call these different gods that landed all over the world. You call them generals, gods, or whatever. And when they landed, they, I guess you can say, maybe the life was already here on Earth. Mm -hmm. And this is maybe where the intervention came in. And they, like in Genesis 126, I believe it is, mm -hmm. let us make God in our image, or let us make man in our image and after our likeness. Mm -hmm. Tell me what you think about this. this. This Mars breakaway civilization that came here, created life, and those are actually our gods that actually broke away. Well, my scenario is a bit different. Um, in my book, The Cosmic War, and, and my operative model, and again, you know, I'm, I'm putting out hypotheses. Mm -hmm. You know, this may be shown wrong, it may be amended, altered, you know, so, you know, this is not something I'm holding with an iron fist, you know, mm -hmm. this, is, this is the truth and you got to accept it. Uh, but my model has always been that there was indeed a very high civilization here on Earth and elsewhere in our solar system. In other words, I think that that we have been operating with an, an unexamined assumption in the sense that we have, insofar as we've entertained that idea, we've limited it to planet Earth. I think it very possible that that civilization was interplanetary. And my model has been that it blew itself up, quite literally, in a war. This is, this is the part of the story that frustrates me because the alternative research community doesn't want to go there. It does not want to view these wars as actual wars, but metaphors for catastrophes and so on and so forth, which I think uh, mutilates the text too much. So my model has always been it blew itself apart in a war, and the war was fought with horrendously sophisticated weapons of mass destruction. Uh, in my model, those weapons were used to blow up a planet in the solar system, which is now the asteroid belt. Mm -hmm. Um, but part of that model has been that, let's say right now, the insane neocons running this country <laughs> and many others mm -hmm. that have nuclear weapons, France, Great Britain, you know, go down the list, um, we get into a nuclear war and we blow ourselves up. Well, I'm not one of those that believes that this would be the end of humanity, but it would certainly be the end of civilization. You know, Einstein's quote, you know, if, if there's a World War IV, then it's just bouncing the rubble, you know. <laughs> so, <laughs> so it'll be fought with sticks and clubs. But, mm -hmm. but anyway, my assumption has always been that, that this civilization would have had continuity of government operations. It would have had surviving elites. And those elites, in the aftermath of such a war, are confronted with the problem. The problem is not just how to survive, but how to jumpstart civilization again. And this is where it gets very interesting. If you're going to jumpstart civilization, if you're going to have civilization, what do you have to have? You have to have commerce. And in order to have commerce, what do you have to have? You have to have a uniform system of weights and measures. So what do you see during the megalithic period all over the world? You have these structures being built that if you examine them, they appear to embody geodetic and astronomical units of measure. Now, why is that crucially important to this model? It's crucially important because, forget the old academic saw that you learned in high school and college that, you know, they were basing units of measure on body parts. You know, if that's the case, there's no standard of measure. It's going to be different from place to place. So an astronomical and geodetically based system of measure is going to be the same for everybody because you're basing it on more or less universally known phenomena. 
So I think the megalithic period, when you see structures like Stonehenge, Aylesbury, some of the hinges in, in France and so on and so forth, I think this is an indicator that you have an elite at work all over the world building these structures to enshrine units of measure. And the other thing that they're going to do is they're going to attempt to pass down their scientific knowledge in such a fashion that that knowledge is not going to be lost in the transmission. And secondly, that it's going to become apparent when humanity achieves a certain pitch of development scientifically to decipher those myths and understand that they encode scientific information, that this is what you're going to do. You're going to create myths that embody a, a scientific concept or concepts that you can easily hand down and that are going to be transmittable over several generations. Uh, you know, they've, they've done studies of, of the aboriginal tribes in Australia, and it's astounding how much information has been preserved without much alteration. So forget that old, you know, saw of whispering someone's in someone's ear, mm -hmm. and, you know, and you pass it around, and it turns out at the end of, of, of the passing, to be completely jumbled from what it started. Mm -hmm. um, I've run a, that experiment, and, and you know I've I've seen it <clears throat> where the information is passed almost perfectly. So it can be done. This is what I think has also happened. Look at <clears throat> books like Hamlet's Mill, uh, von Dechent and Santayana, George de Santayana, where they document very conclusively that these ancient myths are preserving a definite scientific knowledge and astronomical knowledge. So, again, my model is, yeah, there's a breakaway civilization, but the civilization broke away because it had to. It, it was a surviving elite or elites from that war. Uh, the rich get the ticket. <clears throat> the rich get the ticket. And they have to jumpstart things and jumpstart things in a hurry. And this is what I think has happened. So, in other words, I'm I'm... My model is almost completely different than, than the standard academic model. In other words, I'm not assuming we're hunting and gathering for hundreds of thousands of years and all of a sudden we decide to invent Sumer mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, for no good reason. Uh, their, their own textual statements, Sumer, Egypt in particular, Egypt, the very earliest texts in Egypt indicate that they themselves think of themselves not as a... Uh, peak of civilization, but as a declined legacy of something that preceded it. So again, you know, we're not listening to what they themselves are really telling us. And the story they're telling us is something very different. Yeah, there's these breakaway civilizations, but they broke away because of catastrophe. And if you put the war into it, well, the war created the, the necessity to do this. So my model is a bit different. Um, where the Mars flood part fits in is if you look at the work of Dr. Tom Van Flandern, the old naval observatory astronomer, he published a book, uh, Dark Matter, Missing Planets and New Comets, in which he outlined his revision or revival of the old 19th century exploded planet hypothesis. And that basically was, was a bunch of astronomers in the 19th century using a harmonic law that they had figured out to predict, the, you know, the orbits of the planets. Well, that law predicted there should be a planet in the asteroid belt that wasn't there. So they went looking for it, and that's when they started to discover the asteroids, and then they realized, well, these aren't planets. These are just small chunks of rock. So they came up with the idea, well, there was a planet there, and it exploded. Well, Van Flandern revived that hypothesis in the last century, in the 20th century, and his, his argument is, is, to me, is priceless because he's trying to figure out, well, why would a planet explode? <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, it doesn't happen that often. And he comes up with a bunch of models, and this is what really got me on the cosmic war idea. The first model he proposed was that there was a nuclear reactor in the core of the planet that exploded. It went critical, and kaboom. They made movies. And they made similar. movies, yeah. And they made similar, movies about similar, yeah, yes. yeah. <laughs> Star Wars. Mm -hmm. and a galaxy far, far away. You know, and like I put it in, in my second book, you know, in this crazy series I've been writing, it's not far away in space, it's far away in time. It's right here. 
but long ago, mm -hmm. you know. Exactly. And, and Lucas is giving us all of these hints and clues. And let's remember George Lucas is being advised by who? He's being advised by Joseph Campbell, who is, you know, the world famous uh, multicultural mythologist who, you know, is aware of these exploding planet myths from, from various human mm -hmm. mythologies. So Van Flandern moves along to his second hypothesis. Well, maybe he knows that, that a fission reaction is probably not going to be sufficient to blow up a planet. So his next idea is, well, maybe there was a bunch of antimatter in the core of that planet that was somehow contained, and then the containment broke down and kablooey. <laughs> <laughs> and again, you can tell he's not happy with that one. You know, he's he's grasping for explanations. Maybe they had their own CERN project. Well, hang on. And then he finally comes to, he finally comes, and, and I even quote this in the Cosmic War, because you can tell that he doesn't want to go there, but he knows this is really the only explanation for it. He says, well, it may have been some sort of advanced technology that just went wrong. Or maybe it was the result, he says, of deliberate action and those were his words in other words a war mm -hmm. <laughs> and i'll press a button blow up the planet mm -hmm. you know and i thought okay that's that's pretty interesting you know you've got a scientist here that's coming right up to the precipice but he doesn't want to say the w word and um, i think you know it's very clear from from the text You've got the Gigantomachy in Greek mythology, the war with the giants, the war with what? Saturn. You know, mm -hmm. uh, Kronos is the Kronos. Greek word for Saturn. Uh, you've got in the in the entire Sumerian literature, the Enuma at least, you know, which academics, I love this, academics say that, well, this is a creation epic. Bull roar. You know, <laughs> sit down and read the dang thing, folks. And, you know, I defy anybody to read any of it, particularly the fourth tablet of it, and come to any conclusion other than this is a war epic. That's what it is. It's not a creation epic. The creation's already there. Mm -hmm. <laughs> no, they're fighting. So yeah, you've got these you've got these cosmic war traditions, and I think you have to take them seriously. And if you're going to blow up a planet, let's get back to Mars. As I told you, I was going to go around Harvey's barn. Well, Van Flandern speculated that Mars may have been a moon of that larger planet, and that larger planet was water bearing. And when it blew up, what happens? Well, it sends a shock wave of what water. It hits one side of Mars, which is what the geological record shows, strips that planet bare. The shock wave continues throughout the solar system. It probably hits Earth, accounting for the flood stories here and so on and so forth. But yeah, whatever may have been on Mars is going to be in a bad way. And the closest planet to them that you can get to that would be capable of sustaining life after a catastrophe like that is Earth. So Zulus, Dogon, ancient texts, breakaway civilizations, there you go. <laughs> and maybe uh, maybe this, because maybe Charles Ford had it right, um, <laughs> because he talked about, I believe, fish falling from the sky, right? Yes. Well, well, what if that was actually from that, you know, instead of actually here on Earth? I don't want to get too much. No, into no, that. no, 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 no. Fort, Fort is giving you a clue because there is a Babylonian tradition of the fish god. You ever heard of this? The fish god, Oannes, mm -hmm. that comes up out of the ocean and teaches, you know, apparently this fish could talk. <laughs> <laughs> teaches all the little monkeys that namely us that he's discovering you know well why don't you you know why don't you create a civilization here so yeah um that could be uh fish from the sky yeah could be now fort was talking in terms of you know water spouts sucking up fish and you know air currents keeping them up there and then mm -hmm. you know they get dumped but fort also says very peculiar things too like i think we're property and somebody out there, you know, <laughs> I agree. Somebody out there has a stake or a claim on us, you know. <laughs> so, you know, he wasn't stupid, and uh, I think he, I think in some cases he probably hedged his words, you know, because he was already ridiculous enough for that day. <laughs> I loved it though. I, he would have been my best friend back then. Oh yeah, me too. <laughs> me <laughs> but too. Um, back to Mars. 
and you, you talk about this and a few other researchers also that uh, Cairo, mm-hmm. Cairo is Al Cairo, mm-hmm. which means literally place or camp of Mars. Yes. Yes. Place or camp of Mars. What, what does that say? So they broke away and they landed. In, one group landed in, in Cairo. Cairo. Mm-hmm. It, mm-hmm. You know, some strange similarities there, um, Joseph. Very, very, very odd things <laughs> that you encounter when you get into this. Little indicators that there's a there's a much deeper story. Egypt itself called itself Alchemet. Alchemy. Ah. Transmutation of matter. Alchemet. Yeah. Um, you get Toth, the, made, Toth probably made up that word. It's Tehuta. 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 It's oh. pronounced Tehuta. It's like Hebrew. You have to fill in the vowels. But yeah, Tehuta, yeah, is another one of these very strange uh, characters in history. Um, there's other little indicators. You know, the Arabic uh, Islamic tradition of the Sphinx calls the Sphinx the father of terrors. So in other words, you know, I part company from the Jonquils and Daisies crowd that, you know, this is all a big golden age and all we have to do is get back to it. No, the big golden age blew itself up. And, you know, part of the world is is maintaining that that idea that, you know, ancient history wasn't all it was cracked up to be. Uh, it, Plato, Atlantis, Atlantis was a warlike culture and so on and so forth. So... Uh, you know, I, I've just taken that model and run with it, I guess. So, Michael Tellinger talks about this and other researchers mm-hmm. as well. Uh, you may know what I'm kind of getting towards. Do you think we were created as a slave species? Uh, yes and no. I don't think God created us to be a slave species. You know, image and likeness of God does yeah. not does not connote slave species. And in fact, the, you know, the uh, Old Testament statement, you know, you're to have dominion here, uh, which doesn't mean go around slaughtering animals, Mm -hmm. but it means take care of this place. You know, this is your garden. This is, this is your home. Uh, So that doesn't connote a slave species. But I do think that every tradition that deals with this subject, particularly the Judeo-Christian, does indicate that the fall of man enslaved him to processes of thought, to uh, habits of action that essentially are not part of the original scheme of things. Uh, And in that sense, man becomes a slave to these habits. Uh, there's a very famous statement in St. Maximus the Confessor that mankind fell into, this is so, so insightful, fell into dialectic, in other words, a way of binary thinking, either or, everything is opposed to its opposite, and so on and so forth. So it becomes kind of a habitual pattern of thought for mankind at that point. Um, so, yeah, in that sense, uh, somebody or something came along and messed everything up. In the Islamic tradition, Ibris, Satan, the Satan figure, is jealous of the creation of mankind and so sets out to ruin it. Um, kind of speaking of, of war, mm-hmm. and we're talking about the gods and the ancient past, mm-hmm. why does it seem like... Uh, the God of the Old Testament is a war-fearing, doom and gloom type of God. Oh boy! <laughs> yeah, you, you don't have to give me your clip notes. Uh, no, 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 no. I, 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 I wrote a book with my friend Doctor uh, Scott DeHart on that called Yahweh the Two Faced God, because it is clear that if if you look at the character of Yahweh in the first five books of Moses objectively, without the religious programming, it is very bloodthirsty. Is this? The, I don't mean to cut you off. Uh, is this the same God? Before you get into that explanation, is this the same God that created us in, in His image well, after our likeness? Well, the Gnostics would say no, and their their whole point was this moral difficulty with the character of Yahweh. And quite frankly, I had that same moral character. That I had that same difficulty. Mm-hmm. 
um, they would say no, but Christian orthodoxy would say yes. And the reason why it would say yes is that it does not identify the person of the Trinity in the Old Testament with the Father. It identifies the person of the Trinity revealed in the Old Testament with Christ. Mm. Now, there are various reasons why they say that, and they're very good uh, and profound reasons why they say that, but at the same time, that locks them into having defend, to defend the character of Yahweh. This is why the disputes in the first three to four centuries of the history of the church are so, with Gnosticism are so long and drawn out and intense because that moral problem is never really, in my opinion, adequately addressed. So I think you have to do, uh, and again, this is my opinion, you know, I'm going to get in trouble with lots of Christian scholars out there, but but you have thousands of followers, though. Uh, well, I hope, no, I would hope not followers. I would hope people that are thinking for themselves in terms yes. of all of this. Um, I, I think you have to be open to the possibility that there's got to be a fundamental rethink of a lot of these things. And it's, it's going on. It's taking place in the alternative community, although in ways that itself are very problematical, and that's, and, and that's part of the problem. I think ultimately we're going to discover that Christianity's roots owe much more to Egypt than they do to Judaism. All right, Joseph, you, you were just talking about um, that Christianity will finally catch up to terms that its origins and everything are more Egyptian than anything. Right. Explain a little bit more on that, because that, that is very intriguing, I've and, been, and I, I totally agree. I've been dropping lots of clues in various books, uh, and it's important for people to know that I write my books, started out writing them, with the very deliberate intention that they were all dovetailing with each other and in a particular order. So it may seem like that order is very haphazard, but it, it's been very deliberate. Uh, you know, I have about four or five books ahead of what I'm actually writing, where I want to go. So, yeah, I'm telling a big story. You can read the books in any order that you want, but they were conceived in a particular order, but they all do kind of interface with each other. Mm -hmm. But, you know, no one wants to sit down and read, you know, a book that's that thick. <laughs> uh, no one would do it, so that's why all the books. But, um, plus, I don't want to write a book that, you know, it'd take me forever. <laughs> but um, it's much easier to break it up. Yeah, Egypt, I've been, I've been dropping a lot of clues. <clears throat> and, you know, biblical scholarship has, uh, in terms of, of New Testament criticism, has for a very long time been maintaining that there are connections between St. John the Baptist, between our Lord and the Essene community. Well, it's now come out, and I, I wrote about this in Thrice Great Hermetica, uh, a British scholar by the name of Richard Feather uh, documented a connection, very odd connection, having to deal with the with the treasure scroll and the Dead Sea Scrolls with the Essene community to Egypt and to the heretic Pharaoh Akhenaten. Mm. So, you know, that says a lot right there. And there's a lot of other stuff I could say. If you really sit down and read Josephus very carefully, you'll discover all sorts of allusions uh, to Egypt. Um, it's, it's very, very peculiar. And uh, I'll give a hint here. Josephus calls Christ in many, in many places the Egyptian. Mm -hmm. That's his code for Christ. So sit down and read those passages in Josephus, and uh, things will probably start popping out. And then final clue is just remember who Josephus might be. And that's a clue for people who know. Mm. <laughs> mm. Very interesting. And I'll Man. tell you that off, off the okay. air. <laughs> okay. Uh, now, did let's go a little bit back within the next few minutes for, for this segment. Mm -hmm. um, who is winning this this war, Joseph? Because it, who's winning? Who's winning? Because <laughs> I don't know. Because I <laughs> well, what I'm getting at is, it seems like, I guess which of the, I guess the ETs are 
winning this war and have dominion of Earth because it seems like the bad ETs are pretty much calling the shots. Why I say that, if it's the case, I'm just saying. If the bad ETs were calling all of the shots or if demons were calling all of the shots. It's a lot of evil in the world. If the international Jewish Masonic communist banking Freemason, you know, all of the crazy conspiracy theories out there. Mm -hmm. If they were really calling all those shots, things would be much worse. Why is there there now? I, I agree that, that that on that aspect of which I'm just I'm an open book on just pretty much everything. I leave everything open. Um, but why is there so much evil and violence over let the past me, several thousand years? Well, let me flip. Let me flip the question. Theodicy is an interesting question. Uh, the theist has to explain why there's so much evil. Uh, the materialist, atheist, agnostic camp has to explain why there's so much beauty and good. Good you point. Know, it's it's fair. The two things are related. Uh, as for who's winning, um, because you do talk about the cosmic war, right? And it feels like it's almost maybe still going on, maybe. Oh yeah. And we are going to get more into the secret space program and break mm-hmm. away mm-hmm. Uh, later on. Yeah, I in, think in other segments. Yeah, I think I think it is still going on uh, in a very subtle way. Many of them subtle ways, I should say. Many of them spiritual. Many of them more overt. But I think it's still going on. Uh, it's very difficult when you go back and look at those ancient myths to decide if it was the good guys who won that war or if it was the bad guys who won that war. In essence, the war was so devastating that neither one won. You know, they ended up destroying each other pretty much. Mm -hmm. And that's why I think elites from both sides survive, which is why it's so very difficult in the record to decide who who's doing this. What, what side of the moral coin are they on? Because in that kind of situation, where you are literally having to jumpstart humanity. Think of think of Stanley Kubrick's Doctor Strangelove at the very end of the movie, you know, when they're blowing each other up and they're going to have to figure out how to survive. Well, there's there's a brief period where, you know, the Americans and the Russians are, you know, oh, we've done it now, you know, what are we going to do? <laughs> and all of a sudden they decide, well, we're going to have to cooperate, but that soon breaks down. Yeah. Well, I think something similar, if if this cosmic war hypothesis is true, I think something similar has to happen. You're going to have surviving elites, and, and they're going to be making common cause every now and then just to get things done. Mm-hmm. It's going to be like, you know, Don Corleone uh, cooperating with, you know, the other Dons to get certain things done, even though they're enemies. Uh, so, you know, they meet, at, they meet at their table, they smoke their cigars, they kiss each other's rings, they have their brandy, and they have their, their copy out on the street shooting at each other. But, you know, here we're going to figure out how we're going to press forward and go forward. I think that's kind of the situation you're dealing with throughout history. You've got both sides vying for power. The problem now is technology is unifying the world. And so... Mr. Global is in the end game. But the problem is Mr. Global is not a monolithic entity. It's several factions and they all want to be in control and on top. And whenever that happens, you have perfect tailor-made situation for factional infighting. So that's what I think is going on. Um, As to who the good guys are, I think the good guys are quite literally the people that are caught in the middle. It's you and me and everybody else trying to make sense of this. Hopefully, you know, uh, doing so with good intention, good action, you know, and if you're the praying sort, prayers and so on and so forth. And before we get more into the breakaway civilization, Mm -hmm. define your definition. I know Richard Olin has his or, but do you have your own? Mine is exactly his. Uh, I think he came up with such a profound idea based on all of that research he did in, in the two volume uh, study of UFOs in the national security state. Mm-hmm. Uh, and basically I think, I think people have to understand that what he's doing when he, when he mentions this concept 
is giving his best conclusion at that point of the state of his research. So in other words, he's not just coming up with a, a hypothesis he's tossing out there. He's coming up with an actual assessment of what he's seen. And basically his idea is that the national security complex in examining the problem of UFOs created a, an infrastructure and research program that over time, with enough money and so on, basically began to pull far ahead in terms of its scientific capabilities, pull far ahead of the public civilization that you and I are part of. Mm -hmm. And it's been surviving as kind of a parasite on the host. In other words, it's using the host's money, the host's human labor, human capital to pursue these projects, and yet has created a situation where its technology and and this is so important because Dolan says breakaway civilization. He doesn't say breakaway group. He doesn't say faction. He says civilization. Mm -hmm. And a civilization is a culture. It's a an assumed matrix of knowledge and patterns of action that are based on that knowledge. And that knowledge in this case is a very sophisticated science. So this means it's going to affect the way it views the world. It's a cosmology he's getting at. It's going to affect the way it views the world, how it interacts with the world, where it wants to take the world, and so on. All of this is implied in his, in his phraseology. And I think it's very important be, that we understand it that way. Because if you look at the covert projects infrastructure in this country, in the old Soviet Union, in Europe, and so on, if you look at it, what it is, it is a civilization. It has its own infrastructure. It has its own transportation. It has its own commerce. Mm -hmm. And it has borders with the public civilization, the classification, the checkpoints, where you get access to these facilities. So in other words, it has all the trappings of a civilization. And therefore, it may even be its own separate kind of rogue government. And this is precisely what I think we're looking at and why it's so difficult to, uh, to look at how it's affecting things because it's not part of most people's thinking. But when you add in missing money mm -hmm. in the trillions of dollars now for several decades, Yep. If that trillions of dollars were in the, so to speak, the financial circuitry, it would have, and this is where this is where the economic models, the standard models break down. They've been predicting because of this hyperinflation for a number of years. It has not shown up. Why? The only answer is it's going somewhere else that's not part of this visible economic circuitry. It's part of the electricity, in other words, that's going to a completely hidden load end of the system. Mm -hmm. So where's that system? <laughs> you know? uh, so yeah, I think I think once you once you entertain the idea of a breakaway civilization with those kinds of capabilities, it begins to make sense of a lot of the news that you're seeing, but makes sense in a way that any standard analysis cannot, because it's missing, like Catherine Fitz says, it's missing 50% of the picture. Mm -hmm. Now, ask yourself this question. Germany, our, our wonderful ally Germany, <laughs> you know, has recently, well, you know, that's the old Tom Lehrer song. I don't know if you know who Tom Lehrer is, but uh, he was a satirist back in the 60s and 70s when I was growing up. And he wrote these satirical political songs. And, and at the time, Henry Kissinger had proposed, well, let's give nuclear weapons to Germany. <laughs> <laughs> he wrote a song about, about, you know, we've got our traditional allies like Britain and France, <laughs> our, our good old friends, the Germans, <laughs> who've hardly bothered us since 1918, you know. <laughs> but, but anyway, well, recently, about, about uh, a month ago, some German company, a telecommunications company, said that they wanted to build out a 4G network on the moon. Why? Yeah. <laughs> Why do you? Why do you need a telephone network on the moon? Mm. And they're serious about it. You know, this is just, we're going to do this now. <laughs> wow. Well, what that's telling me 
is that money, some of that missing money, is going up there. Exactly. In, in space. Do, do you think, and I, I, we're definitely going to get into more of that. Yeah, I know. Into the further segments. But before we get into that later, um, part of this, I guess, do you think this breakaway group and the players behind, do you think that this these players and this missing money, mm -hmm. trillions, do you think that is part of some of the underground tunnels and bases that are... Oh, possible? sure, absolutely. Think about how much tunnels and underground bases $21 trillion will buy you. Mm -hmm. Now let's really talk. Let's really talk finances. During the 2008 bailout hearings, remember the derivatives crisis, which has dropped right off the radar, inter mm -hmm. interestingly enough. The derivatives at that time were estimated, I think, to be, if memory serves me correctly, between 14 and 17 quadrillion dollars. Mm -hmm. Now, this is orders of magnitude more than the gross domestic product of the entire planet. Mm -hmm. Now, let's pretend we're Venetian bankers on the Rialto. <laughs> <laughs> and our ledger says we're in the red here to the tune of 14, tri 14 quadrillion dollars. What are you going to do with all that bad paper? Why is that there? Why the mortgage on the entire planet? Mm -hmm. Now, after that, isn't it interesting that they've started talking about asteroid mining? And on one of these asteroids alone, they've estimated, oh golly, it's in the quadrillions of dollars. Mm -hmm. Perfect way to exactly. balance those books.